This is Kenny Fikes, your host of the I Know Dot Media Roundtable, where we bring you conscientious clarity through empirical experience alongside reasoned analysis and application. Let's go around the horn. Hey guys, I'm Elisa Simmons. I am living currently in East Texas, and I think tonight's conversation is going to be nothing more than entertaining because it was what we're going to talk about is exactly what I expected would happen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Ellis. Um, I am happy to be home this evening. And um, I'm a physician. I'm a mom of three. I'm a concerned citizen. And um, I took a big, deep breath last night because I knew we we're going to be discussing this stuff for some time to come, what's on this show tonight. So let's just jump into it. Hi, I'm Michael Malabsky. I'm a pediatrician from Denver. Uh, father of seven, and I fell asleep last night before the debate, but I did read up on it. So it was, I, I have the post debate processed uh, uh, response as opposed to the in the moment. So, gotcha. Well, um, I thought it would be good to talk about some of the things that our POTUS, that the POTUS said and did last night. No one's perfect. Mr. Biden was not perfect but he tried to respect the rules, although he said something like, can you just shut up, man? Something like that. But so what I did was I decided to offer a little hope um, in the form of, I just decided to cut and paste some quotes from some of my white friends. And if you wonder why I say some of my white friends is because it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that the majority of black people are outraged by Donald Trump. And even in my sort of slight despair, we had a show recently with Comrade Tillard and David Holder that offered some hope. Um, and so I'm gonna offer some more hope in this mess, saying that we can't do it alone and that we are brown and, brown and, and, and yellow people and whomever else that Mr. Trump doesn't like. Um, and so, there has to be allies. We've talked on this show before about the Jewish community and the black community that were allies, allies in the 50s and 60s and working this thing together. And so from its most dastardly perspective out there, um, or from the most dastardly perspective, you'd say, well, we're outnumbered. So, so I caution brothers, meaning black men, who say, hey, man, I'm ready for them. I got my piece. I got my, I go, look, man, you just simmer down because I hope you have some ammo, not that I expect or want a war, but they've been buying this stuff up for years and I've been convinced that Steve Bannon's behind a lot of it. Now, with that said, the hope is, I'm not asking anyone white to die over it, um, but people die in revolutions, right? There's no revolution without bloodshed, Malcolm X said. And why 12 quotes? Because that's what kind of fits on the page, cutting and pasting. Could have been 13, could have been 11. Um, and so I hope there's some, I, I believe that there's some hope when we understand that brothers and sisters are with us. Uh, so again, uh, it's also because black lives don't necessarily matter to this administration. And when you are marching in lockstep with your white sisters and brothers, if you are brown and black, then I think they're less likely to drop the cannon on you. Um, so let me start off with a quote from a good friend from high school. And she responded to one of my, so, so I posted on, on Facebook um, that essentially it's, it's over, done, it's a wrap, mic drop, I don't want to have any more conversations about uh, policy and politics and left and right and agreeing to disagree. If you support Donald Trump, I just can't get with you, please unfriend me. Sounds really childish, but I meant it. Um, so she posted. And we'll go around the horn and just, you got to say what you want, but I'm really going to read you these quotes and see what your perspective is from a hopeful perspective with our allies, right? So this is a white female, went to boarding school with her at North Philmont Herman in Massachusetts, and she went to college at Vanderbilt and uh, is from the Northeast, currently lives in Massachusetts. She wrote, I recently walked away from a long-term friendship, and then that person posted something about her dismay at how I treat people who vote differently than, than me. Really, she's missing the point altogether. The hoe, quotes again, 
the whole let's agree to disagree on this approach has stopped working a long time ago. The choice is rooted in politics. The choice isn't rooted in politics. It's rooted in racism. Either you support it or you don't. I adore and respect you, Fikes. She always called me Fikes and I always called her Lewis. Um, what do you got? Let's see. He's going, Michael, you've been away. Why don't, you get, why don't you start us with this, Michael? So as, as someone who doesn't consume a lot of this stuff primarily, um, I, I continue to, at times, harbor some hope that there are examples of what things could be that perhaps people are capable of overcoming or rising above whatever the election result is. So look, there's the, there isn't any question. I don't think anybody could watch what the proceedings last night. I only saw the clips and come away with that, um, that he's anything but uh, a monster and an idiot and he shouldn't be a leader. But there is a very, very reasonable chance he could be reelected. And, and um, so the person I am most interested in, and I, I don't know if any of you guys read my post I wrote about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia. Um, I, thought, I, I thought that that was such an example of, of what things used to be. And, and maybe could be, why can't we get there again? If, you know, uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Angela Scalia were ideological opposites, yet they vacationed together. They had a healthy respect for one another. They held each other personally in very high esteem. They were both great intellects in their own way, but, they're, but uh, they attacked each other's ideas. But there wasn't any, there wasn't any personal animus. It, you know, being aligned with one set of ideas didn't turn someone into a monster in the eyes of, an, of the other. And yet it seems that that's where we are. And, uh, and that's what I've been thinking about when I think about all how, how and, and that everybody who watches that debate, almost everyone was watching it from the perspective of their own. We've just talked about the self-constructed echo chamber that people now live in of their own making. They're never challenged with ideas that conflict with their own. They never have to confront anything because they, they, can, they can live in their own cocoon of ideas electronically and with the media. So they never have to face anything uncomfortable or how to understand or deal with op opposing ideas. So every, that, that debate didn't change anybody's mind. So I, I wonder, and I thought thinking to myself, isn't there, is, there, is it possible that we could overcome the decision no matter what, or is it just too explosive and too divisive for people to get there if things don't go the way that each side hopes? So interestingly enough, you know, that whole confirmation bias idea where people read things that support what they believe and watch and listen for the cues that support what they believe and look for aha gotcha moments. The difficulty with me on that last night was, I think if you watch Donald Trump and you still support him, what you're basically saying is I really don't give a damn about reason. I don't care about these other things. It's just rooted in racism, proud voice, stand down and stand by because there was nothing to convince you, you're just taking a position and a stand. Also, um, you talked about Scalia and RBG and, and their sort of ideological differences, but respecting each other as person. So we're gonna have two, two uh, people should go to I know, I-K-N-O-W dot media, M-E-D-I-A, and you will see that in our group, our own Jay Sheree Ellis and Franklin Ferguson, who was on the show, Jay Sheree is writing a piece um, that is a pro-life, I'm sorry, a, a pro-choice piece. And, and uh, Franklin will be writing a piece that is a pro-life piece. And those are two people who are brilliant and respect each other, but are approaching this from a different perspective. So we have it right in-house. Wonderful. And with that, that's a good segue into you, Jay. You know, I think that um, one thing that we have to do in this climate is establish certain boundaries with people in our lives. Um, I think that for many black people, I know for me, um, there's, there's just gonna be that line in the sand. It's not just a matter of differences in ideology, which we can come to respect one another that we have different opinions. But if there's someone who's in my life who professes to be a friend, care about me, care about my kids, and they are willing to endorse a man who is a clear racist, um, inspires and evokes violence against pe non-white people, against non-Christian people. Um, you know what, I, I can't really trust you in my inner circle, right? And so 
the, I can, I, I, I don't even respect your feeling about this if you're willing to endorse that, but I've come to the place where I decide I don't need to argue with people any longer, I don't need to debate, um, because especially after last night, if you can um, accept him like this and say that this is okay or make excuses for it, then there's no way you can look at me personally and say, Jay, I care about you, I care about what happens to you and your kids, because you kind of don't. Uh, maybe you care a little bit because I'm in your inner circle or in your space, but if you didn't know me, you wouldn't care. And so there's a point where like any other unhealthy relationship, and, and this is what it comes down to with the people in our lives, whether they're Facebook friends or neighbors that we spent time with, whatever, if this is unhealthy because there's one of us who doesn't care fundamentally about bad things that could happen to the other, then we, we kind of don't need to have anything to do with each other. And so I think it goes beyond just having different ideologies. Um, I think we, we are establishing some boundaries, some of us, and saying that you just don't need to be in my life because I'm not going to convince you. And last night, I think most people probably watched that debate already knowing who they would vote for. Like, I kind of felt like I didn't even need to watch it because uh, right. there was nothing Donald Trump was going to say, nothing at all that would make me vote for him. Um, but my kids turned it on and I was in the kitchen until I kind of got drawn in and I knew I needed to watch it just because I needed to know what was being said. But honestly, I don't think they were, either of them was going to convince anyone to vote for them if they didn't already plan to going into that debate. And so my response, I think, to people these days, if they seem to support this craziness, is just going to be, you know what, thanks for letting me know, because I needed to know how you feel about racism. And then that's it. We don't need to have any more discussion about it. I don't need to say I'm unfriending you. I don't need to tell you and walk away from you. I just need to not spend any more time or energy on you. And I, I think that's how I have to maintain my own sanity because I don't want to be angry at people every day for the rest of 2020. Yeah. yeah and, and I don't, my post, I don't think you, you can tell me if it sounded, I don't think I sounded angry about it. It was just a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, and in person, I'm not going to say anything to anyone like, Hey, I can't be your friend, but they would probably notice that they haven't heard from me in a while. Um, also one of the, popular comments amongst friends who are white on my post was, well, we just didn't watch it because it's nonsense. We knew that there was going to be nothing good to come from it. And my response to those friends was, I understand and respect that. But for me as a black man, it's imperative and too important because it's dangerous to know what this fool is saying and to tune in and hear it for myself. For example, when I posted that he just told white supremacists to stand down, but stand by, I posted that before I saw it come from any other place. And it was in a news cycle because I was listening um, because my family are in his sights or is in his sights. And so that's why I can't stand down from listening to him at, cer at a certain point. I don't listen to everything, but uh, what do you got, Alisa? Well, Jay, when you were listing the people that Trump is willing to incite violence against, I think we need to go ahead and accept that, it's anyone that doesn't agree with him. It, it, it isn't truly any more a religious situation. It's not a skin tone situation. It's anyone who doesn't agree with him. Because last night, the, the I, Kenny, I was with you. I was texting with my brother and I called him and I was like, he just said, stand by. Like we're military family. We know what stand by means. Um, but that full line was, what, 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 who, who do you want me to denounce? Who, 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 who? stand down, stand by, pause, someone needs to deal with Antifa. And traditionally, most people assume Antifa is predominantly white. And so it is anyone who opposes him and his base, and he's willing to incite it. He says it repeatedly, Democrats, Democrats, liberals, liberals. That's his bubble, and we all know exactly which groups are included in that. But the people in Portland, the majority of the people there are white. And so it's, he's creating this super hostile um, environment for our country and that's dangerous. And it's, and it's extremely not, it's, it's very much not the America we portray to the rest of the world. We portray we're on the superior level of, of unity and all that neat fun stuff. And so I feel like if you, for me personally, I, I think I've spoke with Jay Shree about this before in the past. I have bubbles and my first bubble is me, my husband and my children. My second bubble is you. So you get the, the closest you are in my bubble, the more information you get to share, the more I trust you. And 
if you watched last night and you made any assertion, if you made any assumption from what he said that didn't call the alarms to you, your bubble for me is now passing. Like you don't get to be in a bubble because I no longer can trust you because you've proven you don't see you, you, you are a loyalist. You've proven that you're on a team and that team means more to you than anyone in your real life. Yeah. Hey, and I've said it on solo shows. He's out in the open. The dog whistles are really clarion calls and through a bullhorn at this point. Um, and it amazes me how, well, it doesn't amaze me, but again, if you see a pink elephant in your living room, every time you go by, you're going to be wild by it. You're not going to just go, oh, it's the elephant. So the fact that those in Congress have ostrich syndrome again, and we know that they're hiding, it is just, it is, it is unbelievable. Um, so I'll read another quote again, that is hopeful that we have allies because these are just people that I know, my personal friends. So I hope that is indicative about lots of other uh, white people around the country. This one said, there is no redemption for him now. That he hasn't rushed to clarify or walk it back means that he owns it. Anyone who supports him now owns it too. It is disgusting that we're not seeing a parade of Republicans distancing themselves from this racist. They own it too. He sees himself as far more clever than anyone else. It's a game, a mockery. Back to you, Michael. So, you know, I've made this point before in this group about him and I, the, the, the articles, the, the most interesting articles that I've read this week, I don't know if you guys have read, were the deep dive that the New York Times took into the tax return issue. I don't know if you guys had a chance to read those. But I, I, I and, and I'm, I'm, once again, I'm going to preface this by saying I can't pretend as a Caucasian in America to to share the same response experience because you're right, I don't, I don't feel the same under threat idea because of where I live and who I am. I can say that the white supremacist issue in America also greatly disturbs and creates a lot of fear and anxiety in the Jewish community. As I told you in my adult life, uh, my entire life as a practicing Jew, I have never gone to shul with guys with open carrying weapons for protection until two years ago. So it, it, it really has changed how the Jewish community feels about what's going on and people like the Proud Boys. If you guys recall in Charlottesville, what, what were, they were chanting, Jews will not replace us when they were marching through the town. So I think the Jewish community certainly feels that same level of discomfort and threat and anger when it comes to him supporting that group of people. But I, I truly, truly feel after I read those articles and I processed the debate, he truly is valueless. I don't, I don't believe that he has enough depth to even hold these things as actual values. He's only, only trying or only thinks about what will benefit my brand in the short term. And this group of people I know like me, so I have to somehow in whatever dog whistle or whatever way I can preserve that for just in the end, the end game is only what enriches Donald Trump. And that's it. That's his only value. He's, he has no compass and he, has, he is amoral. And I, I think it's even giving him too much credit, honestly. I think calling him a racist gives him some kind of moral compass or some kind of cognitive platform that he stands on. And he has none of that. It truly not. I, I think he's an empty vessel and has been for a long time whose only singular thought is promoting and advancing personal interests with no moral, amoral um, vision. That, I think you guys are even giving him too much credit. Yeah, I, and those dog whistles are real and, I, and Jewish people feel the threat but as well with those groups. But I believe it sounds like to me, he's just wherever he can, I like, they like me. Do you remember, remember what he said about QAnon? Are you guys aware of the far left QAnon thing? These mm -hmm. people that, that believe that, that Donald Trump is some sort of superhero fighting against uh, underground child sex trafficking and in the government and the deep state, and the only one defending everybody could be Donald Trump. Have you heard of this guy? Yes, and yes, when, yes. When, he, when, he was asked, when he was asked about that, he said, 
I don't know. I've heard they like me. Like he had no no other position on it other than that. I think that's how he views these yeah. people. Well. Yeah. So, 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 Michael, two things in there. One is, of course, uh, Jewish people are going to be disturbed by this man because they march under three banners. One right. is the flag of the United States of America. The other is the Confederate flag. And the other, sometimes you see the swastika on the flag. And so they put those things together. And one of the things that bugs me is that they've sort of commandeered the American flag to go with those things. And I was with someone recently who said, you know, as an American, a black person who said, you know, as an American, that's my flag too. And now it almost represents racism to me because I've seen it with those guys so much. And that's pretty sad. On the thought of him being an empty vessel, go back to Mr. Malika, Mr. Malofsky's introduction of two things being in, uh, sharing the same space. And we've been running with that thing. I think they can share the same space. Someone else asked me recently, it was my pastor. Right. If I thought that he was just, if, that, if I thought that Donald Trump was just a straight up racist or crazy like a fox. And I think it's both. Just because the guy is maybe a sociopath, a pathological liar, has no moral compass, doesn't mean that he doesn't hate brown people. Um, I don't think you have to be intelligent to be a racist true. Um, and have a strategic plan to be a racist. Um, <laughs> ignorance goes with that as well. Uh, Jay, what do you got? I agree that he that he doesn't have morals. I agree that he does not have integrity, um, and I, I certainly believe that that he's a narcissist. Um, he's also just a very hateful individual. Like he's hateful. It's, it isn't just black people that he hates. Um, he hates anyone different, or he has contempt at, at the very best. He has contempt for anyone who's not like him. Uh, he has contempt for women, as we all know, and it doesn't matter if those women are white or not. I'm quite sure most of the women he was grabbing were white, so he wasn't placing a value on, on his white sister. Um, but, he, but he's very hateful. And I think what happens with the black community is that we, we, we keep challenging the status quo and he doesn't appreciate it. Um, but before he got there, he was racist and he was um, a part of an empire that was racist. And that has been proven in their business dealings in New York City. Um, with everything that they did with their housing practices. That was proven um, with, with Trump Casino in Atlantic City and how he treated black employees and black dealers. Uh, he had a problem with black people. He's happy to oppress them. But I think that he's also happy to oppress um, Central and South Americans and he calls them all Mexican, right? So that he's happy to oppress them. He's happy to treat them without dignity happy to treat women without dignity. He's happy to treat Jewish people without dignity. I think the reason that he is a, a little bit maybe gentler in his words with Jewish people, and, and I really hate to say this, but based on things that, that he said and that are written in books about him, he values Jewish people because they take good care of his money. Yeah. But beyond that, he doesn't, because he's not up in arms even when Jewish people are under attack. How many synagogues have been uh, attacked? How many Jewish people killed? Um, under his watch, and he never really gets up there and says, I'm going to denounce this. So yeah. in his failure last night to denounce the KKK, to just come out and be like, this is unacceptable, and I'm not going to have this going on my watch. Meanwhile, we know he's coming up with this beautiful platinum plan for the Black people, but he couldn't come out and say that the KKK was a problem. It means that he's okay with Jewish people being attacked. He's okay with Mexican people, Asian people, Muslim people, anyone who's not white, He's okay with them being attacked. And my guess is that if somehow poor white people came under attack by someone and he was asked to defend them, he wouldn't do it. It's just that he's not ever asked to distinguish between the two. So he, you know, he has just levels of hatefulness. The saddest thing about this is that he is one of the most powerful leaders in the world and that America knew this about him before he was elected. And over these last almost four years. He told us something last night that it was 47 months. I realized that he can't multiply. But in the last almost four years that he's been in office, um, all he's done is to perpetuate division. Um, and he's not only perpetuated division, he's been unprofessional. He's been unpresidential. I mean, there is just nothing that we can look to that really is redeeming about him. And, and it's really sad that at this point, with all of that that's out there, people will support him. That's the sad part. I think that we're, what we have to be able to get past at some point, I mean, because God forbid he's elected, 
that oh. will be a time when it's even more important for us to be able to get ourselves together and, and really be unified. As a black person, I wanna see our issues addressed, but I, I don't think that any of us will really make any significant headway unless the different groups that are being oppressed like come together and really work together to make this happen. Right. We need to be working with the Latinos. We need to be working with the Asian community. We need to work with the Jewish community and the Muslim community. We all need to be one big group saying like, you know, this shit ain't cool. You know, we need to be ready to do that in case this man is reelected. And, and, and I think that we're gonna have to get ourselves together and make that happen. And even if he's not reelected, we still need to do that. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same things. I shouldn't sit back and be tolerant of Mexican people being oppressed. I shouldn't sit back and be tolerant of Muslim people being oppressed. I need to speak up and That's say right. that. But more than that, I think we need a cohesive effort. That's right. I agree. Um, I tend to make notes uh, to follow through, to follow for myself on the show in terms of topic and what to ask and then other points, side notes. And at the end, I've shared this with you guys before. We never actually quite get there when I have some queries at the end for myself in the notes that we don't get to. And then what's the solution? I promise you m more than 70% of the time, which I guess by math would be 21 shows because today is happy 30th for us. Today is our 30th show. Um, that the answer is always that people need to come together and work together as a solution. Elisa, what do you got? Does everybody remember the Queen Latifah song, you and, you and I, T-Y? That's like, that should be our theme song right now. Um, I, Kenny, you said something that I've actually been really dwelling on a lot over the last few days. And you said that they've hijacked the American flag. Um, I've mentioned it before. I'm a military brat. Just recently, um, a lot of the people I grew up with in Japan started a new Facebook page. And we've been talking about a lot of things. And one of the things we keep hitting on is the idea that for us, like we stood for the national anthem at the beginning of movies. So when we came back stateside, it was weird to us that y'all would just start watching movies. Like who, who didn't stand up for the, the national anthem? And, and so we're all a little baffled because our developmental period for socialized um, observations was done in a different country. So when we come here, even though I'm almost 40, I'm gonna be 40 next month almost next month. Um, when we come here and we watch this, it's baffling to us because we learned how to be patriotic. And so the, the right wing people have, uh, have taken what we need to take back. And I strongly believe everyone on the left needs to wear an American flag nonstop because standing up to oppression is, an Amer is the, the beautiful ideal of what America was supposed to be about. And I think we need to take it back. Um, I think we need to rock it all the time. I think we need to make it our flag again and not associated with the swastika and the Confederate flag. And, and I think that that would be a really powerful movement for us to do because you can't then say we're unpatriotic. This is true. This is true. So let's, we're going to do, um, we're, we're going to have another show soon, uh, but we're going to try to wrap this one up. We're almost at 30 minutes. Um, Michael, what I'd like, you to add really quickly is just talk, um, you know, if you can give us a two minute synopsis of the Jewish holidays right now and what's, what's going on. So I think most people who live in any major urban center know that it was just Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, but uh, I think what people don't know is the holiday that follows Yom Kippur is the holiday of Sukkot. That's that, uh, that's a sukkah behind me. And um, Sukkot's kind of a unique Jewish holiday because it focuses not just on Jewish history or Jewish redemption in, the, in our relationship with our creator, um, but it also focuses on the Jewish relationship with everybody else in the world, humanity. And that it, 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 it reminds us to recognize that there's a divine spark in every person, regardless of whether they share your appearance or your belief. And, and therefore every person, every person is deserving of dignity. In fact, you know, you guys know that, you know, when the sun goes down, when it's the Sabbath or holiday, right? The, I'm not, I'm not available. But as a physician, you realize that I have a mandate that if someone, if I have a, a situation where I need to alleviate pain or I can intervene, I'm, I'm supposed to drop all of those things in order to do that. And it doesn't differentiate whether that person is Jewish 
not Jewish, black, white. It, it, it's because they are a human being. And in, um, and in fact, we're supposed to put human dignity above just about any other, um, anything else when it, when it comes to our interactions with other people. Now, we don't always live up to that ideal. We've seen Jewish people treat uh, black people atrociously. We've seen, uh, you know, we've all seen that. But, but the ideal is real. The truth is there. It's, 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 it's part of what we're supposed to be recognizing and how we're Thank supposed to be functioning. I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna do a little part with Jay and Elisa as well to get us out of here. But um, unfortunately, I believe Christians do across the board. Sorry to say, no, I'm not. It's my observation. I'm not sorry. <laughs> do a pretty bad job of not treating people who are not Christians with equal respect. Um, Jay Sheree, what do you know about? perhaps maybe the Black Panther movement from the 60s or so that people have a misunderstanding about and what those people were fighting for? I think a lot of people don't realize that the, the Black Panthers were there to really empower the Black community. I think one of the more common myths is that they were just a super militant group and their sole purpose was to figure, up, figure out how to kill and, and bomb white America. Um, and that they didn't do anything else. But in fact, their purpose was really to empower the community. So one thing that they often did in communities was they would help to provide, you know, free breakfast for kids who were in school, making sure that those kids had what they needed to start the day well and to be successful at school. They also did provide some degree of protection for the Black community, but they taught the Black community a lot. And so a lot of their platform and why they carried guns was because of their Second Amendment rights. So what they nicely figured out was what their rights were under the Constitution, and they wanted the Black community to understand what those were and to, and to feel like it was their right to, to, to be exercised. And so, so much of their platform was about empowerment of the community, not about oppressing another community, and certainly not about attacking another community. But when people hear about the Black Panthers and they don't, they don't know anything about it, what they tend to hear is that this was a destructive group. You hear about the ones who went to prison. And, and you don't hear the beautiful things that they did. So Elisa, down there in Texas, um, red-blooded white Americans, American flag, military, good people who just love their country and are patriotic. What's a misconception that folks might have about them now based on what has been happening with the commandeering of the American flag? And what can you tell us to give us some hope? I think that there's a lot of people that we assume because they live in the South and that they're white, that they're racist. And I think that um, we had a, a guest on previously, our producer, Keisha, and she was saying racism is um, a lot of it has to do with fear. And I think that sometimes their fear comes off as hatred. And sometimes it has nothing to do with hatred. It has to fear of the unknown. It has to because it's been taught, because it's been exposed or lack of exposure. And I think a lot of times when they are able to connect with people that are outside of their comfort, their comfort zone, that a lot of people grow and grow quicker than we think that they do. Um, and I, I think that at the end of the day, most Americans just want to have a happy life and take care of their children and you know, raise the next generation to be a little bit better than we were. And sometimes they, they don't know that what they say sounds so old school to people who have been exposed to more than them. Gotcha. Well, thanks for that. That was a fun little around the horn to wrap it up. And uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi.